Yeah, so hi, Ryan Williams uh, from Hammer Lab. Uh, this is going to be kind of a sprint, uh, so I'm going to try to get through a lot of material, just call out if something doesn't make sense. Um, we'll do a quick intro, a genomics crash course. I'll talk about this tool called Guacamole, which is something that I've worked on a lot at Hammer Lab. Uh, and if we have time, which we probably won't, some other interesting applications uh, of sort of like distributed compute on uh, genomic data. So, uh, yeah, Wes talked a little bit about Hammer Lab. Um, when Jeff started it like three years ago, a, a big focus was um, writing tools to analyze genome data because there's just a lot of it. There's a lot of opportunity to apply sort of distributed systems best practices to improve some of the workflows that exist in that space. Um, We've, over the years, really moved into a lot of applications in the cancer immunotherapy realm. Um, cancer is, most of the genome sequencing that happens is targeted at diagnosing or treating cancer. Uh, cancer is a disease of the genome, so it's kind of like the main application for uh, a lot of the cool sequencing technology that's come out over the last, like, 15 years. Um, we prioritize writing high-quality open source software, uh, which you can find on our GitHub. Uh, okay, so quick genomics sequencing crash course. Um, you have a trillion cells in your body, and each one has a full copy of your DNA, which is like three billion bases. Uh, a, a base is one of four molecules, A, C, G, or T for short, and you have sort of, it's, it's wrapped in two strands. The information is kind of redundant on each strand, uh, which is part of how the whole replication process works. You can split the two strands and they can kind of be reconstituted separately from one another. It's sort of like nature's trick for doing replication that underpins all of life. Um, the uh, DNA is really fundamentally information. It is a like uh, linear um, representation of you can, uh, it's, it's analogous to source code that the cell basically just sort of like opens up different parts of and runs the programs that are described there to do all the work of being a cell. And uh, we want to read that source code, fundamentally, uh, is, is the problem. Um, the DNA is packaged into chromosomes. There are 22 in a human cell. There's actually two copies of each chromosome there, and each one is maybe 100 million bases long. Um, so if you, if you laid them out end to end, they would be like a football field long, uh, but they're actually sort of packaged into a cell that's like a micrometer in diameter. So it's like an amazing kind of feat of physical fractal compression. Uh, you, know, you start with sort of like winding it in a helix, and then the helix sort of winds in a superhelix, and then that superhelix winds in a super superhelix, and you have like sort of 10 orders of magnitude of like packaging this uh, information into a very small volume. Um, we're sort of like, we, we don't actually don't even know what the shape of a couple of those middle order of, uh, orders of magnitude uh, is. Um, they're just like super intricate, tightly packed molecules, super dense with information uh, that we want to read, and we mostly can't. Um, uh, we would love to be able to just read these chromosomes end to end. No one's figured out a way to do that. For the purposes of this talk, all we can do is read 100 base long fragments of DNA. Uh, whereas the chromosomes we're trying to read are like 100 million bases long. So basically what we do is take a bunch of copies of the DNA and just shatter it into tiny bits that we can read, and then we try to reconstitute those bits into a picture of the uh, original genome. Um, everything from the middle of this slide onwards in the pipeline is entirely computational, right? The sequencing machine gets us from the, the top row and some stuff predating that of how we sort of like distilled the cells into just the DNA and like do the, the, the shattering and then the reading. Um, and then, you know, reconstituting these like small sequences into the larger sequence is an interesting computational problem I'll talk a little bit about. And there's a few other downstream steps that I'll try to quickly overview. Um, the, the sort of color scheme here implies a uh, global uniqueness property to some of the sequence that doesn't really exist. Uh, it's, it's much messier than this. Um, so just quickly kind of back of the envelope talking about what it takes to store and process human genome data uh, in ideal and real world settings. So as I mentioned, you have three billion bases. You can sort of think of each one as one of four possibilities, which can be represented by two bits. So you'd have four bases per byte. So three billion bases would take up about 750 megabytes of space. Um, 
a optimization or observation is that uh, far less than 1% of that sequence is unique from person to person. So if you were trying to store like many genomes together, you could sort of compress those down in a way where each marginal genome might only offer sort of like seven megabytes of new information in, in the sort of information theoretic sense. Um, so you could kind of squint and imagine storing like everyone in the world's genomes in like some tens of petabytes of data. Um, of course, like having one giant gzip file with everyone's genome in it wouldn't be any of any use to anyone. So you'd want sort of data structures and algorithms that operate on those data structures that don't exist yet. And that's sort of an area of research. It's all very interesting, uh, not really that connected to what happens in practice today. Uh, what we get is all of these DNA fragments, like a billion of them that are 100 bases long. Uh, so that's like 100 billion total sequence bases. And um, that's enough to cover a 3 billion base pair genome at about 30x depth. So like on average, any position in the genome will have like 30 fragments overlapping it that you can sort of look at. Hopefully there's a clear consensus about whether the person has an A, C, G, or T there is kind of the game. Um, of course, you know, some regions will have less coverage and some regions will have more. And so that's 30 is sort of like the standard that we do that sort of trades off the cost of marginally more sequencing against the like benefit of the information, you, the marginal information you would get. Um, these bases we get off the sequencing machine don't just have the two bits representing the A, C, G, or T. They also come with a quality score that represents how uh, sure the sequencing machine is that uh, of, of the of the guess it's made about whether that base is an ACG or T. Um, so now you're looking at more like a byte per sequence base that you're storing. Uh, and so you're quickly more in the realm of like 100 gig gigabytes to store one person's genome. And so like large scale sequencing projects these days might deal with 100 to 100,000 genomes. So you're quickly in sort of like cluster scale compute realms where you don't want to just be doing this on a server under your desk. Um, uh, brief overview of just like the recent history of sequencing human genomes. The Human Genome Project took 13 years and $100 million 13 years ago. Uh, later there was a thousand genomes project that was a few years and still like um, doing marginal work. Um, took like four years. Uh, in, the British government is currently doing a hundred thousand genomes project. Um, a lot of people have seen this slide which is just like a precipitous drop in the cost of sequencing over time. Uh, the end of this slide is sort of like, a, or this graph is kind of like, you start to run into a lot of marketing speak from the sequencing companies. Um, I think it's sort of actually like plateaued for the last several years and it's given, I think, everyone in the space a, bit, a chance to maybe catch their breath and wait for the next like breakthrough in sequencing technology to upend everything. Um, but either way, uh, there's, there's no doubt that the number of genomes being sequenced is just like skyrocketing and we're quickly going to live in a world if we don't already live in one where like on the order of millions of genomes have been sequenced. If we're talking about 100 gigabytes per genome, like it's just like where's everyone putting that data? Can we ask questions of all of it at the same time? Today the answer is like resoundingly no to those questions. Um, so it's just like some of those things are uh, things that my lab thinks about. Um, okay, so the first part of the genome analysis pipeline is we have all these fragments and we need to reconstitute the genome. Just gonna try to breeze through a couple observations about that. Um, the genome is kind of a mess, the human genome, uh, all of them actually. Uh, they're just like all kinds of evolutionary detritus laying around. Uh, excessive repetitive structure makes it really hard if you only have these like small sort of windows that you get to see uh, to figure out what's actually there. 20% uh, of the human genome is retrotransposons, which is basically these like parasitic uh, bits of DNA that just encode, they, they are the source code for a program that when the cell runs it, just makes a copy of that source code and puts it somewhere else in the genome. So you've got, there's like one of those that you have, it's 7,000 base, bases long, and there's 100,000 copies of that just laying around, just being junk and taking up space. Um, so it's just, you know, it's like not intelligently designed, you might say. Um, like it's, uh, it's, it's a disaster, and it's especially given like the, what I've described of how the sequencing platforms work, it makes it really hard to figure out uh, what's actually going on. Pseudogenes is like a marginally less sort of uh, annoying version of this where like an entire useful functional gene was copied at some point to some other chromosome perhaps and uh, now that you have two copies they can just sort of drift evolutionarily and so you have like large amounts of sequence that are just like really similar but not totally identical and so it just makes things really interesting when you're trying to reconstruct these genomes. Uh, 
with short reads. Everyone still basically with me? Anyone want to call out a question? Did it, have I glossed over anything that didn't make sense? Um, yeah, you try to reconstruct these genomes by just stitching together the overlaps of these like small fragments of DNA, and you have these like repetitive regions that will have many branches in and out, so you get yourself all tied in knots. People have made uh, beautiful pieces of software that let you visualize just how hosed you are in these situations. Um, so you kind of can't do it from scratch. So the, uh, the, the state of the art, or what is usually done in practice, is we use a reference genome, which is like some consortium of people spent a lot of extra money to sequence a genome in a bunch of more complex ways and sort of validate it in a bunch of ways that lets them get C longer than 100 bases in any direction. So they have like reasonably high confidence that we have like a mostly complete whole genome sequence. Um, as an aside, there's like parts of the genome that no one ever has ever successfully sequenced. They're just like bundled too tightly. Like the middles of the chromosomes tend to be just like wound up so tight. So there's a bit of a like mission accomplished syndrome with like all of the like proclamations that we've like ever even sequenced a whole genome. There's like just unresolved bits, but whatever. We have a good enough reference, and so we just take these little bits and we align them to uh, the place on the reference that it seems like they map. If that is if, if it's sort of unambiguous, then that's great. If it's not, maybe we just throw them away. Um, the good news is, like, most of the genome actually sort of, like, you look at a 100 base pair window, and it's, like, basically unique, so you can take one of these segments, and, and everyone's genome is similar enough to everyone else's that, like, most of them just kind of match. So what this view is showing is that all of these gray bars in the middle are reads that have been mapped, and they are gray everywhere that they match the reference. So like everything in this picture basically matches, except for like a couple uh, random uh, errors, basically. that You can look at them. They're sort of, they, they look like noise. Uh, they're just like the sequencing machine made a mistake there, right? Like, like here, it's thought this read has an A. The reference has a C. Clearly, all these other reads that all, that all map to the same context as that read, just match a bunch of bases in every direction. So this is just an error that the sequencing machine made. Um, so that brings us to variant calling. Like at this point, okay, we've mapped all the fragments. Uh, we want to actually go through and find the places where it is different from the reference. That's sort of what the point is of sequencing a person's genome. Uh, so this is an example of what that would look like. Uh, here we have the reference genome on the bottom. And all the reads in the picture basically match the reference everywhere, except at this one position, all the reads say that the person has a C when the reference said T. So that is like as, as clean as it could be. Uh, this person has that uh, T to C mutation there, and you hand that downstream to a clinician who can look at what gene it's in. Like, does that do anything? Maybe, probably not. In most cases, sometimes yes. Um, so, and we call that a variant or a mutation. It's, uh, sounds like a kind of pejorative term. It's just an observation of like a diff. Uh, a line in a diff, if you will. Um, so it's, uh, in general, it's slightly more complicated because you have two copies of every, every chromosome, so almost every mutation is gonna just happen on one of the copies and not the other. So the more sort of like platonic ideal of a variant looks more like this, where again, everything in the picture matches the reference, great, except for this one place where the reference has a, red is T, I think, and yellow is uh, G. So we have like about half of the reads have a G and the other half have a T, which matches the reference, so that's like a pretty clear case where one of the chromosomes has this uh, T to G mutation and the other has just the reference T. So we would look at that and call that heterozygous variant. Uh, again, this is uh, a mercifully clean example. Um, so much more complicated problem, and the one that I spend a lot of my time thinking about is uh, som somatic mutation calling. So in this case, we're not just sequencing like one population of cells, like just that we've taken from a person and comparing it to a reference. We are sequencing two populations from a given person. So the common case would be like, we are sequencing some tumor cells from a cancer patient and also some normal cells. Uh, and what we are interested in are the mutations that are specific to their tumor cells. So you know, we, we sort of conceive of each of the populations of cell in isolation as like a diff from some reference and we really want the diff of these two diffs uh, to figure out what is specific to the tumor cells, because then that can potentially tell us about things that have a, a you know clinical relevance to that, how that person will be treated. Um, so here's sort of clean example of what that might look like. So we have the reference genome on top. We have a bunch of reads from the normal cells uh, in the on the also on the top, uh, slightly below the reference, and then the the tumor reads 
show that about half of them have a C, whereas the reference and the normal cells have a G. So this looks like a somatic mutation uh, in the, the tumor cells. Maybe like, again, one of the two chromosomes in the, the tumor cells has this mutation. And then, you know, we, so we flag that and then like downstream, like are there kind of like things we can um, infer about where it is in the genome? Is it likely to be causing any of the problems uh, causing the cancer or is it just incidental? Um, here's an example where like seven bases are just deleted. Um, so the, so I guess like, it's my cursor, yeah, cool. So like the normal uh, reads match the reference, which is down here at the bottom, it has a G. Uh, this is like the primary tumor. It looks like half of the reads show like seven bases being deleted. And then like down here, this is from a recurrence sample, which probably means like maybe some chemotherapy or something was administered. And then they sequence the cancer cells that are left after, or that, that come back after the cancer has recurred. And in this case, you might sort of squint and say like, well, it was only, only half of the cells had that deletion originally, and now they, it looks kind of like they all do. So it could be that that deletion allowed the cancer cells to escape from the chemotherapy that was applied. And those are kinds of questions that we want to answer. Um, so somatic mutation is really hard because cancer is just, uh, the regular genome is a mess and cancer is like way worse. Um, it's just like kind of hyper, in a hyper mutating state and it's got its whole own family tree with subclones that have their own mutations that can exist at arbitrary fractions of the overall population. Um, and at the end of the day, we just don't have, with the sequencing technology we have, we can't really resolve this stuff perfectly. And to make matters worse, like often when we, see, when we sequence tumor samples, we have normal cells mixed in with them, so like if you see like half of the reads in a tumor sample show a mutation, you don't know if that's like 100% of the tumor cells reads had that mutation and you just had half the population was actually normal cells that got mixed in there by mistake, or if actually it was all tumor cells and just half of them have that mutation. Um, so, so, so it's a hard problem and it's basically, you're only gonna do as well as sort of like the Bayesian models and other like guesses that you make. So there's like a lot of tools that try to do this and they mostly don't agree with each other. They just, like, have like a lot of just parameters that tune their sort of Bayesian models they apply to these situations. And they're very sensitive to what parameters you set. And uh, a sort of second order problem that they have is that they take a really long time to run. So people mostly just run them once with one set of parameters. Like you know that probably the results you get are very sensitive to the parameters you picked, but are you gonna run it again and wait another five hours? Like no, uh, what would it even tell you? I don't know, why don't any of these things agree? It takes too long to run, nobody has time for that. So that was like a lot of the motivation for writing Guacamole, which is this somatic mutation caller that we've built over the last few years that runs on Spark uh, and that we run we, on our Hadoop cluster at Mount Sinai. Um, okay, cool, so that, that was the end of the genomics crash course portion of the talk. Um, so the, uh, the, the records we're dealing with at, in Guacamole are essentially like the, uh, the, those 100 base pair DNA fragments and what we want to do is basically just step over them like in those uh, visualizations I showed you. And basically for a given genomic locus, consider all the reads that overlap that locus, count how many match the reference, how many don't, and just sort of like look at some other context about the reads. Like does this read have a lot of errors? Maybe something's wrong with it anyway. Uh, and we want to throw it out, like yada, yada, yada. That's sort of like step four is like the application logic. So the interesting thing here for the purposes of what, um, what I work on in this talk is sort of like steps one through three where we take these, like, gen these um, DNA fragments that have been mapped to genomic intervals and we kind of just like uh, build these sort of like uh, what are called pileups where it's just for a given locus, all the reads that overlap that locus um, in a massively parallel way so that we can do it quickly in a way that's easier to audit. Um, so the way that works is um, we basically, you know, when, when we split up all of the genomic loci and the reads that cover them onto different partitions that we can sort of just like map over in parallel, um, we, the, the main thing we want to avoid is like excessive skew because like the underlying data is super skewed. Like it's just common to have like uh, some parts of the genome where like a ton of reads overlap those loci and others where not that many overlap, so the, the blue bars in this uh, graph are kind of representing that. So we can, we sort of do a, uh, we, we do a first pass over the reads where for each of the 100 loci that a given read overlaps, we can emit just like that loci comma one, and we just do wor word count, which Spark makes very easy. We can get a sort of uh, distributed representation of like 
a loci, comma, the number of reads that overlap it. And then we, and we sort of have those organized by uh, like in, in sorted order so we can sort of step through um, those uh, loci and coverage counts and sort of aggregate the loci into contiguous ranges that um, we can sort of like assign as a partition that in the next step we will then take all of the genomic reads that overlap any of these partitions and send them there. Uh, I don't know if that makes sense. Anyone have any questions so far? Cool. Um, so having, having come up with a partitioning in this step that we think will sort of evenly spread out the reads when they are mapped according to that partitioning, we then send the reads to the partitions that have been assigned the loci that those reads overlap. Um, this is one thing that makes the, dealing with this kind of data tricky is that because they are sort of they're sort of ordered and they are intervals. You can, you, you almost anywhere you draw a partition boundary in the genome, you're gonna have many reads sort of straddling that boundary. So as part of your partitioning logic, you need to send the reads that overlap those boundaries to multiple partitions. So it creates sort of a like temporary uh, dicey state uh, in terms of the abstractions that Spark presents and that you would normally have like in just like in a Hadoop MapReduce setting where it's like you have this like large uh, data collection where uh, for one of the intermediate steps here, like some of the elements in there have been duplicated in a way that's like very tied to how they are partitioned at that moment that we're going to resolve like in the next step. But um, all that having been done, we basically can then stream through like each uh, each partition in parallel can sort of go. It has all of the reads, or at least a copy of every read that overlaps any locus that has been assigned to that partition. And so we can kind of like have our mappers just like stream through those partitions full of the read copies and at each position just perform some logic on the pileups that are at the, the pileup that is at that locus. So here I've like highlighted uh, like you might have three reads overlapping, two of them are A, one is C. What do you want to do with that? Do you want to say that that C is an error or that that person has a heterozygous A to C mutation there? The reference was an A. Um, so that's where we just like you know, dump some application logic on it and then the distributed systems work is kind of done. Um, so uh, yeah, this is, this is all basically built and the infrastructure works and we are kind of in the place where we're iterating on that application logic portion. So we have our Hadoop cluster, it's like 100 nodes, 2400 cores that we run it on and um, it goes, uh, you know, can process a, a whole genome in 10 to 20 minutes. Um, compare that with uh, one, of, one of the tools you might use otherwise uh, on the right side here, which is take two and a half hours just to run on chromosome one. Um, the way that people usually run these things in production, tools that are not massively parallel like guacamole, is like you basically just like, you split up the data manually yourself by what chromosome it's on. It's just sort of a coarse grained way that you can, that you can do things. And, that, and chromosome one is the largest chromosome, so generally if you do that work, you can have the entire thing run in the amount of time that the tool takes to process chromosome one. Um, it's, you know, it, it works, uh, but it's a sort of unfortunate, it's, it's coarse grain number one, and you, you sort of leak a lot of your parallelization logic all the way up into your workflow managers that are now moving around like 22 files for the different chromosomes, and you're running all these different jobs. It's like, you know, it's, it, I think there's a lot of opportunity to just have these things be built in the way so such that they run in a natively, massively parallel way and can be just kind of run elastically on public clouds or wherever. Um, so that's great. Uh, then the next step is sort of like, okay, well let's take all that like pileup logic we wanna look at of like, okay, how many reads match the reference? How many were variants? What else is happening on the read? Are the qualities of these reads high or low? And like all these other things we wanna look at um, and just put some machine learning on it. And that's sort of like the next step that we're kind of working on now. Um, a big problem under, underlying a lot of the difficulty uh, in the space is that there's not a lot of validated data. Like we don't actually know what the ground truth in any of these somatic genomes, any of these cancer genomes, like did it actually have the mutation there or not? We sequence the same uh, patient like some months later, their cancer has evolved. Uh, and also we don't have a way to like generate ground truth sequencing very easily. That's sort of the point, like this, these pipelines are supposed to sequence the genome. So we kind of like don't know where we're wrong. Um, a lot of the like validation work that happens will basically take a bunch of calls that existing callers have output and then go like deeply sequence the genome at those positions to try to validate those calls. Um, and so that can tell you 
true positives and false positives, but it can't tell you uh, true negatives or false negatives, I guess, is like one problem that, that sort of underpins a lot of the studies here. So we're also in parallel kind of trying to curate a lot of, like, to the extent to which any validated data sources exist that we can then just like run a bunch of models on. That's like something we're actively working on as well. Um, okay, uh, th there's just like one other thing I was gonna talk about. How are we doing on time, Wes? Okay, cool, I'll try to breeze through this. Um, so I had to write recently a kind of interesting distributed algorithm for a QC analysis problem I wanted to do on some genome data. So uh, up until now we've talked all about genome sequencing. Uh, much more commonly done in practice is exome sequencing, which is just where you sequence just the genes part of the genome, which is actually only like 1% of it. Uh, you sort of don't bother with all the other junk that I talked about before. Um, the downside of this is, oh, so, well, another upside is it's a lot cheaper. So, and so it's many, many, this has been done to many more genomes than whole genome sequencing. Um, a downside is that the 1% the you're trying to get is not like just like 1% at the front. It's like just, it's like 10,000 fragments uh, scattered all over the genome that are, uh, the genes, and so for each one, you sort of like, uh, you have like special adapters that bind to the region of the genome on either side of the thing you're trying to capture, and so you dump that in with the genome, and you just pull out the bits that those adapters bind to. Um, so it's a much more intricate kind of like sequencing process in some ways, and you're much more prone to having those adapters just kind of like if the person has a mutation in the, in the place next to the gene that the adapter was supposed to bind, then you might just miss that gene. So like it's very common that you have this data and you're and that you're like, is did this even get what we wanted it to get? And we don't necessarily know. So the question that I want to answer here is just uh, basically like of the genes we were trying to capture in an exome sequencing run, how many? had at least X reads covering the normal sample and Y reads co covering the tumor sample. Because the X and Y are important because that sort of has a bearing on the statistical power that we have downstream when we're variant calling, right? Like if only three reads cover a thing, uh, cover a locus, you, you can't really say with high confidence that there is or is not a variant there. Um, so the, the, the plot that we're trying to ultimately generate is looks something like this, where you have like the X axis is the depth in the tumor sample, the y-axis is the depth in the normal sample, and what the shading represents is the percentage of the genes that we tried to capture that we did in fact capture at at least that x and y depth, right? So like this is saying like 93% of the, not, not the genes, of the actual like loci that comprise those genes that we wanted to get uh, are covered with at least 30 reads in the tumor, and 10 reads in the, in the normal, and so that g would give us like a certain amount of power to like say certain things about the variants that we found there. Um, so the way that uh, I computed this was basically you take all of these reads and you can uh, do the, the first kind of like word count transformation that I described before, where you just say like for every locus that the read covers, you admit uh, uh, that, that locus comma one, you count them up, so you have like, okay, here's that locus comma, how many reads cover it? And you're doing that sort of uh, for both the tumor and the normal sample. So you'd say, so for each locus you have how many reads cover it in the normal sample and how many reads cover it in the tumor sample. Let me sort of like invert that tuple to count up how many loci have that coverage in the normal and tumor sample, uh, full stop. So like we'll have like a tuple that's like 30 comma 10 comma one, and we count those up, and we want to, uh, that, that, that will tell us how many of the loci we were trying to capture had exactly 30 reads covering it in the normal, or sorry, in the tumor, and 10 reads covering it in the normal. And then we want to, and you can think of that as sort of like a PDF of a joint probability distribution. We're tr basically trying to compute the CDF. So it's like a, a long convoluted explanation to, they were basically just doing like a, a, a distributed two-dimensional prefix sum. Um, so I made like a small visualization of how that works. So like if we start, we have this matrix and the, the small boxes here you can think of as like spark partitions that have some integers. And this is key to sort of like, this, is, this would be like the, the tumor depth down here and the normal depth there. And so it would be like one, two, three through nine and one, two, three through nine. So that two in the upper right means that like there are two of the loci that we were trying to sequence had eight depth in the tumor and eight depth in the normal. And we basically want to take 
each element in this matrix and replace it with the sum of all elements that are above or to the right of it across all the partitions in the matrix and, and including itself. Does that sort of make sense? Um, so, first thing we do is within each partition, we just do a, a, pre, a this sort of two-dimensional prefix sum. So like if you just look at the upper right partition, we had like, it's basically all zero, we had two, five, and one. So the two stays at two. That's the sum of everything up and to the right of it. This seven is where the five is. The five had this five and this two. This was a zero, which gets the two from above. That's like the sum of this rectangle up and to the right of it. And uh, eight is sort of the sum of this entire partition, right? So all the, the, you know, all of our mappers just do this to each small box in isolation here, right? So now what we're gonna do is basically uh, ship around the leftmost column, bottommost row, and bottom left element from each partition to all of the partitions that are to the left of it, below it, and below and to the left of it, uh, respectively. So I have like a small animation of what's happening there. So like this partition is going to send its left column over here and over here. It's gonna send its bottom row down here and down here, and it's gonna send its total partition sum uh, to all four partitions that are below and to the left of it, right? And then this one's only sending each of those three things to one other partition, and so on and so forth. So then on the, on the receiving end, like this partition down here, it's gonna receive like this row from the partition above it, this row from the partition above it, this column from the partition to the right of it, this column from the partition to the uh, right of it, and also this green element from the four partitions that are up and to the right of it. And so that's enough for it to say, okay, I know my own like intra-partition partial sums. Uh, so like this element needs basically the column sum from this partition, the column sum from this partition, the row sum from this partition, the row sum from this partition, and those green numbers from all these, which encapsulate all of the data that is sort of up and to the right of it. So you sort of like then basically just like one giant shuffle step, but that is like uh, linear in the size of the entire data set, so it's fine and you get your entire like global prefix sum out of it. And so that's sort of like how uh, I was able to generate this plot where you just had like, you know, the, the, the maximum depth can actually goes out a good deal past a thousand here. Um, so anyway, so there's a, a, just, I think a lot of opportunities for uh, just like um, rewriting and uh, existing bioinformatics tools and also uh, writing new ones that don't exist to solve a lot of the questions that people in some cases aren't even asking because they are uh, mostly just tailoring the questions they ask to things that they can um, answer with constrained comp computational resources. Uh, so doing all that in like sort of massively parallel uh, settings like using tools like Spark and the, the Hadoop stack has been a pretty like interesting process uh, for me and for the lab. And I think that was all that I had. So, thank you.